or x equals imagine five imaginary what is the y-intercepts of this polynomial so first of all what kind of polynomial uh, function is this like the name of it Any, anyone? You guys can unmute yourselves and answer. Uh, what type of polynomial was it? Yeah. Let me look at my notes real quick. Is it what? Let me look at my notes. Okay. Is it is it exponential? It's not exponential. It says it in the name. Oh, is it just cubic? It is cubic. Oh, bruh. So I don't know why my Apple Pencil is not working. So it is a... Oh, no. Okay, I don't know how this is going to work. Okay, there we go. Maybe. So it is a cubic polynomial. It says it right there. Meaning, how many zeros does it have? Um, three, no? Three. Yeah. So, we have three zeros, and they tell me x equals five and x is five imaginary. So, what could the third zero be? Could it be 25i? No. Think about it. When I have an i, what is always attached? Uh, square root of negative 1, right? No. Not the square root. Negative 1. Oh, we're so close. What is one? special about imaginary numbers? That they're imaginary. Okay, aside from that. Uh, I know is it I know when they're squared it equals negative one, but oh no. <laughs> so the magical word. Magical word. You wanna you wanna tell us that I'm no you're gonna guess what it is. <laughs> We're doing hangman right here like Nico. The second class. A. Mm. E. Okay. I. Nope. P. P. Yeah. No. No. V by any chance? What did you just say? V by any chance? No. No. Oh. E. What letter? T. T? Yeah. Yeah, like tiger. Conjugate. There it is. Every imaginary number has a conjugate. Mm -hmm. So if I have 5i, that means I also have. If you have 5i, you also got. Uh... Negative 5. Negative 5, right? Negative 5i. Oh, right? so negative 5 cubed. Okay, that's, that's uh, negative 25 then. That's your conjugates, right? So if I were to write these out as zeros, I would have x minus 5, x plus 5i, and ooh, I'm running out of space, x minus 5i, right? I have the conjugates and the originals, and then I just have that minus 5. But do we have this book or no? What? Do we have this book? 
Well, now what are you gonna have to do? No, I'm, I'm asking for like, like, do we have this book? Like, is this the Barons? Um, no, this is the the one that I bought separately. That's the only one that currently is for the AP Precal course. Mm -hmm. um, but I am going to be making copies of these reviews and then giving them to you as well. So Sorry. hopefully this week before the Thursday um, meeting out, I should have copies for you guys of this. Okay, thank you. And everyone gets the copies. It's not just if you attend these meetings. We'll just go over them in the meetings. Okay. I have a question just about the conjugates. So the conjugate of like positive five I is negative five I or is it just negative five? It's negative five I. Okay. Because the I is what has that negative. Because remember, what is right. I? It's the square root of negative one, right? Right. And every square root has a positive and a negative version. Yes. So that's what's happening. You have the positive 5i and you have the negative 5i. Okay. So now we have to foil. Boo. <laughs> <laughs> so I will let you guys practice your foil. So my advice to you would be foil the conjugates first. And then deal with that one in the middle because the conjugates should get rid of your eyes and then you are at a much happier place okay Negative five i times x is negative five i x, right? Yes. I did it. So Sorry. how many of us have already done it? I think I did it. Uh -huh. Give me a second. I think that's the proper way to do it. 5xi, but it doesn't really matter because it gets canceled out anyway. So gone, leaving me with the x squared. Now i squared is equal to what? what negative one. Negative one. Negative one. So negative one times twenty-five. Positive twenty-five. Beautiful. Oh wow, I'm actually dumb. Okay, wait, hold on. <laughs> which is out of practice. So now you see, now you're left with two binomials, which is much nicer to deal with than if you had done the x plus five oh, and oh. one of the imaginaries would have given you a much larger polynomial to multiply with the remaining binomial. Wait, what did you do? Wait, Why are you doing x plus was, five? Was like, x minus five. Like, oh, it's what? x minus five? Yes. I'm old and forgetful. Right. I'm supposed to multiply all, all three of them? Yeah, you're doing all three of them. You have to find what the intercept is at the end. You can't figure that out from only foiling two values. So you have to do the third one. So why does my equation look so long? I'm trying to fix my audio. 
but I feel like an feel echo like is going to be recorded. Yeah, there's an echo. Yeah, I don't know why. Give me a second, guys, to see if I can fix this. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead. Did we foil it already? I did. I did. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and do X. Oh, Q. I see what the issue is. Oh, boy. I'm stupid. No, we're not stupid. Just out of practice, out of practice. No, yeah, because okay. what's it called? I did it straight on, and I foiled uh, the X minus 5I and the X minus 5. Well, I should have done like the eyes first, you know. Oh, so Wait, you did what I said not to do. What? You did what I said not to do. Did I? I don't know. I said do the two imaginaries together. Oh, I, I guess so. All right, so we should have gotten this, Emmy. Is that what we got? Since yes. Emmy's oh, I, I, Emmy's good. Emmy's good. Go to Holly. <laughs> I'd like more participation from us. I know that there's more of you here. Um, so. Wait, but isn't it negative 25? Where? Like, because on the on top part, we have negative 25 I, I with the exponent of 2, right? And then. But well, remember that the I squared is negative 1. So the uh... negative, one times the negative 25 gives me the positive 25. OK. So meaning that this is my cubic function that they talked about. So what is my y-intercept? My y-intercept occurs when what equals zero? Repeat the question. My, my y-intercept is when what equals zero? You got a 50-50 shot. Is it the 125? X equals zero. So when x equals zero, which as Lisa said, the intercept is going to be the 125, because every single value that has an x is going to have a zero. And anything multiplied by zero is? Zero. Zero. So all of those are gone, leaving me the negative 125. So we have now officially answered the first question. So I was right. <laughs> yes, we were right. Now, how can I just move? Oh, this is going to be a pain. I need to fix my Apple Pencil immediately. Wouldn't this have a fun to, to get you a new one? No, I have one. It's just, I think the, the like, nib part is, like, broken. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's a little bit chipped off. All right, so that gives me, what is my final answer? A. A will be my final answer, the 125. Yeah. All right, now look at two. I know we're excited for that one. No. <laughs> it is a lot, but it's actually very simple. Um, it's just a lot of words to get through. So the first thing says, at time, or wait, I think we messed up somewhere. I'll check number one again. Wait, what, no, did, we I, I think number one, we're good. what did we say number one was again? Negative 125. Okay, no, we were right then. I th I was thinking it, we've said B. So yes, negative 125. All right, so number two says, at time T equals zero seconds, a child and her father to each toss the water balloon into the air. So this is a lot of nonsense words that I don't actually care about. The only things I really care about is it's a quadratic function of H of T is the height of the child and H of 2T is the height of the father, right? When the father tosses it. So choose the sentence that correctly describes the father's toss. So now I'm gonna look through my answers quickly before I do any kind of decision-making. And I'm gonna see the first one says the initial height from which the father tossed the balloon was double the initial height from which the child tossed the balloon. That sounds pretty good. Uh, the father tossed the balloon from a place that is two meters above where the child tossed the balloon. No. The father tossed the balloon twice as high as the child did. And the time it took the father's balloon to hit the ground is exactly half the time it took for the child's balloon to hit the ground. So which ones automatically do we think we're looking at? Andy. Right. 
A and D, because they're the ones that make the most sense in regards to the information I'm given, right? I'm given H of T and I'm given H of 2T. So the other things just says that it's two meters above where the child tossed the balloon. That doesn't really make sense. And then the other one is that it's tossed twice as high as the child. Well, that also doesn't make sense since this is talking about a general function, not a specific value. So my hint to you for this question is this question is all only talking about transformations. So what transformation is happening from H of T to H of 2T? The time is being doubled. Mm. Well, I was just, what, what transformation is happening? To the right. No, up, up to, up to. Okay, okay, pause. Let's <laughs> take a second, right? Now, when what operation is happening with the two? Is it being added, multiplied, divided, whatever, whatever, whatever? Which one is it? Multiplied. It is being multiplied, right? Hey, yeah. sure you are you are correct. Uh, um, <coughs> Sorry about that. You did. I got I got excited because Keisha got the right answer. I started choking. <laughs> so multiplication is happening. Multiplication means what transformation? Well, uh, dial. No, no, I did a home. Yes, yes, yes. Dilation. Horizontal. It's a, dil it's a dilation, right? Got to use was more specific there it is a horizontal one because it's directly affecting the t remember that if the number is on the outside it's a vertical dilation or a vertical stretch or shrink but when it's on the inside it is a horizontal now when it's a horizontal remember that anything that's inside of the parentheses with that x is doing the opposite of what i think it should do right so if i'm multiplying by two Right? I look at this question and in my head I go, oh yeah, times two. But in reality, a horizontal dilation of looking like this is really multiplying by what? Think the opposite. By one half. By one half, exactly. So, between A and D, which is the correct answer? D. 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 Because the A... Like, and, and when I looked at this problem, my initial thought was, oh yeah, double the initial height. And then I looked at it and I said, wait a second, this is a horizontal, meaning it's gonna actually be half the time. So whatever answer tells me half the time, that's the one I'm going with. You can also notice that every single answer aside from D mentions two, double, two, twice. That is all telling you, like, it's trying to trick you, basically, right? Because most of the time, we don't want to pick the one answer that's different. But in this case, that's the actual case, right? I, I want the one that's half, not the twos, okay? Now, this one you should be able to do on your own. Calculate the equation of the slant asymptote. So how do we do this? Oh, my God. This is, like, way back. I know. But we love doing this. Is it? Is it the synthetic division? So this so this is polynomial long division. You can either use the old fashioned way or as Heisha said, the synthetic. Personally, I would do synthetic because the bottom, the denominator is a binomial. It's a lot easier also to do that. Now remember that with a slant asymptote, when you are doing the division, the remainder does not matter. All you need to do is get up to the point where you have a remainder and then everything before it is the equation for the slant. So I will, oh my gosh, I don't know how to change pages now without this pencil. Nope. Oh, wait. No, it's, it's... all right, I'm giving up on that. Okay, so I have the box. There's my box. Now what goes inside the box? What number? Positive three. Positive three, because remember that the default is x. My, oh my gosh, is x minus h. 
So if it's a negative, that really means it's a positive three. <sighs> and then all the values that fill up on the top are going to be all of the values that are in the Oh, this is so frustrating. I can't change pages. There we go. It's going to be all of the coefficients in the numerator. So what are my coefficients in descending order? Now, before we do that, let me ask, are these uh, exponents in descending order? No. No. No? Oh, the, the exponents, Wait. yeah, but the coefficients are not, no? Doesn't matter. Don't care about the coefficients. I care about the exponents, right? Oh, Remember, yeah. So synthetic it has to go in order so if i start at two i need to have x squared x to the one x to the zero do i have that yeah yes so that means that when i go to my synthetic i can just write in two six nine that's it i don't have to put in remember that if i had one of the exponents missing, I have to put a zero as the placeholder, right? So let me do an extra page. Um, so let's say I had the same thing, right? I'll, I'll keep x minus three, but let's say I had four x cubed minus six x plus nine, right? What am I missing? Oh, uh, an x a squared. I'm missing the x squared, right? So that means that when I did my synthetic division, I would have to do 4, 0, negative 6, 9. Without this 0, my answer is wrong. Okay, so it's very important that we you have to check that it is in the correct order before you want to set up the synthetic because it's not going to make much sense if you don't put the zeros in, right? So who can tell me how I do the synthetic division? Guide me. Yeah, I, I can't help you on that one for no. Oh my gosh. You anyway. bring down the first number. Thank you, Kazi. Now what? And then you multiply that number that you brought down by three. So three right? times three is? What? Two times three is? Six. So that goes under the six. Now what? You subtract. Ooh. No, you add. I add. I'm, I want to say, I like to say combine because... If there's a negative, then there's subtraction happening. If there's no negatives, it's just adding it up together. I'm just combining the values. So now what? Uh, you repeat the same thing with the 12. So you multiply by 3 and then put it under the Three Is what? 36. 36. I don't really care what's going to be 9 plus 36 because why? Because it's the remainder. It's the remainder. Don't even care what number is going to be here. All I care about now is that I have the 2 plus 12. Now, if I go back to my answers, well, there's only one option with 2 and 12. But I do want to remind you when you are doing this division, because, for example, if it's on a FRQ portion, I want to make sure that we remember when it comes to writing out the equation, remember that it's going to be written out with the coefficients and you are starting with one less than your original in the numerator. So since I started with 2x squared, my 2 has a variable of x with an uh, exponent of 1, right? 2 minus 1 is 1. So if I had a 3, the first value of my uh, slant asymptote would be what exponent? x squared x squared exactly it's always one less than what you started with so so for these questions i should have been highlighting these for my people who will watch these videos later so there's a we had d for the next one and then this one is what d d can you try doing the polynomial division with this problem as well do the long division? Yeah, you can do long division. Wait, Pernum, how do you uh, get to 36 in the synthetic division? Oh, in the synthetic division? So if yeah. I go over here, 
remember, I bring down the, the first sign. I bring down the first value, and then I do times the number in the box. Then I combine these two, multiply this by the number in the box. Oh, uh, okay. And then that's how it happens. It keeps going. Uh, if they were asking you to divide it, then obviously the remainder does matter. But in the case of a slant asymptote, it does not matter to me. Right? Yeah. We're good? All right. All right, we did three questions in about 30 minutes. <laughs> um, when we finish the entire unit, by the way, all the, the units that we need to cover for your exam. Basically, like the first day after we finish it, I am going to give you a diagnostic. So you are going to have a full on all units exam uh, covering it. So that way we can kind of see what really needs to be focused on and, and we can go from there. Okay, number four. So number four is very interesting. Right, it gives you a table and it tells you values of the fourth degree polynomial are uh, g of x at selected x values are given in the table above. All real zeros of g of x have multiplicity of one. The graph of which the function must have a whole at x equals negative five. So that last part is the most important part. So how do I have a whole in a function? Hmm. What is the key to having a whole in a function? You can look at your notes. If you need. Yeah. you would have like the same value in the numerator and in the denominator. Exactly. So I needed to have the same thing in the same place, right? So in this case, what I need to have is I need it to be zero in both the numerator and the denominator because it has to be a whole, right? So it has to have zero in the denominator. Because remember, this is an entirely, uh, we're talking about a, a, a different function that has similar, value, similar values and everything as the g of x, but it will have a whole at x equals negative five. So I need to make sure that I have zero in both the denominator and the numerator. So basically, I kind of want to just go through each numerator and denominator and figure out which one is going to give me a zero in both. So in this first example, I have a, it is x plus five, which if I had a negative five in the numerator, that's x my, uh, Negative five plus five equals? Zero. Zero, so that checks out. Now in the bottom, it tells me g of x plus two. So my x is what? Five. No, negative. negative. Negative five. So negative five plus two is? Negative three. Negative three. Now, the thing is, do I know what value my g of x has at negative three? No. Wait. No. I don't. Oh. Right? It's not in the table. Could it be zero? No. Why not? Because uh, x equals 5 is already zero. So if it's 3, it can't be. No? I mean, if it's negative 3, it can't be, no. But why not? Can you give me a 100% a accurate answer of is g of negative 3, 0? Without making any assumptions, without saying, well, I think according to this, can you 100% for sure give me a value that g of negative 3 is 0? I mean, given is that... It, uh... is it Thank you. Sorry, um, is it because it's a fourth degree polynomial? Not that it's a fourth degree. Although that is possible, right? A fourth degree would have four zeros. So I only have two listed there. But but can I for sure say that negative three is zero? No. 
no, I can't. Now, if I, so this is like, I like this question because it is very, very nitpicky, right? And I think that is very, very important because what it's saying is that it must have a hole at x equals negative five. There is no, it's possible, nothing like that. It is yes or no. If I cannot for sure say that g, oops, that g of negative three equals zero, I cannot use a, right? If they had asked me a question that said, which function could have a hole at x equals negative five, then sure, I can pick that option. But if it's telling me it must have it, then I can't. And most likely there is an option that is better, right? There's a reason why that must is there. So I move on. For B, if I replace all my x's with negative five in the numerator, what do I end up with? Seventy. In B? Uh, Seventy for the numerator. Okay. So in the numerator for B, I have negative 5 squared plus 7 times negative 5 plus 10 uh, at the end there. What is uh, negative 5 squared? Uh, 25. And then 7 times negative 5? Uh, negative 35. Oh, yeah. I messed up. <laughs> Meaning it's what? Uh, zero. Zero, right? So numerator checks out. Now the denominator is easy, right? It tells me g of x. So at negative 5 is my y value 0. Yeah, that's 2. That's not going to check out. Nope. So not b either. Now in c, so if I put negative 5, so negative 5 minus 2 gives me what? So repeat it. Negative five minus negative two. Seven. Negative seven, right? Well, if I look at here, my x at negative seven, oh, that's already looking pretty good, right? Now I need to check the denominator, right? I can't just make the assumption, ah, this one's good. I got to keep going. Now, the denominator, very similar to the numerator. Now, Frank, what is the answer for the denominator in this one? Uh, Is it? Is it 70 this time? This is the one that is 70. I think you might have like combined them or something because that oh, is I guess forgot to I forgot to consider the fact that seven times negative five is negative thirty-five, not positive. Yeah, so so that you did the right work for the denominator in this case, which would have given me a positive twenty-five plus thirty-five plus ten, which would give me that seventy, which obviously does not equal zero. Leaving me with D. So in D, they give me the same numerator as C, so I already know that that checks out. And then it tells me where H is a cubic equation whose only real root is X equals negative five. When I have a root, what does that mean? That my Y value equals? Uh, double the root? No. What? Zero. Zero. No. My my roots have a, have a y value of zero. So that means that I have a zero in the numerator and a zero in the denominator. So D is the only answer that must have a hole at x equals negative five. Yes? Yes. Okay. Now, lots of graphs. We, we, we see this. Unit one is the very heavy graph section. I'm sure yeah, we remember that. Yeah, it's a nightmare. That. Yeah, so... Uh, the best part is, is that I believe that the majority of your exam is on unit one. Um, yeah. It's very heavy on unit one, uh, a good amount of unit two, and unit three is the lightest section. So, um, you know, I'm hoping we will finish up unit three before April 29th. That is my goal. So that way we have a little bit more time, but we will have these study sessions and if it comes down to it that we need a little bit more study time, I will see about working it into a schedule so that, you know, you guys have as much uh, time to review as possible. All right. 
So let F be a portion of a cubic polynomial that is defined on the closed interval of one is less than or equal to X, which is less than or equal to five. The graph of F is shown above. Choose the true statement. So they tell me the graph of three of F of X plus three has no Y intercept. So here's my regular graph, right? Hmm. And it tells me, that if I apply these transformations, there will be no y-intercept. So I'm going to kind of ignore the dilation for right now because to me, that's the one I don't really like to deal with. I'd rather do with any transfer uh, translations or reflections. So that x plus 3 means that my graph does what? Moves three space to the um, right now. No. Remember, if it's in the X, it's in like the twilight zone. So it's not really to the right, but to the left. No. Yes, to the left. Mm -hmm. So if I move my graph over, like I don't even have to move much. I can just pick one point and move it over three units. So here's one, one, two, oops, two, three, somewhere over there. Why not? Is my graph going to cross over the y-intercept? Yes. Yes, right? I, I just moved my first point over three units to the left, and I'm already on the other side of the y, meaning mm. that there has to be a y-intercept, right? Yeah. So A is not the right answer. You get that? Yeah. Wait, so how would a graph not have a y-intercept? Well, right now it doesn't have a y-intercept. You see how it doesn't cross the y? Oh, okay, yeah. Now, the equation of f of 3 of x is equal to x has exactly three solutions. So I have to now figure this out and decide, will this one work? So what transformation is happening here? So. Horizontal dilation. Horizontal dilation by a factor of? Three. Twilight zone, twilight zone. Negative three? No. One third. <laughs> one third. There we go. Thank you, Kathy. It is a horizontal dilation by one third. So... I need to figure out that if I replace x with the one third, or I multiply all my x values by one third, I should have exactly three solutions. So this one is kind of, uh, I don't really like this one, but you know we're going to go through it, right? So if I have at x equals one, what is my new, so x equals one, and it's being multiplied by the one third, I have what? What do I have? Um dilation the dilation right now. Oh, oh. When I multiply one by one third, I get what? One third. One third. There we go. <laughs> so right now that that tells me, remember that a, a horizontal dilation won't affect the Y values, right? Because it's only affecting the horizontal parts. So now my X, instead of being at one, is at one third, which I don't even know how I'm going to add that into my graph here. See, it's gonna be like somewhere, somewhere around there. I know. And then my, I'm gonna do the ends, right? So I'm gonna do this one, and I'm gonna do the five. So five times one third would give me what? Um, it'd be one and two thirds, right? What? Oh, keep it as an improper. Five over three. Five over three. You 
Easy. Keep it easy for you. Okay, that's a five, not an S. Just mm -hmm. bear with me. All right. So now I have those two endpoints, right? So I want to see, does this work out? So if I were to replace 3x, right? There's my transformation. And I were to go ahead and do 3 times 5 thirds, what would that give me? What would be my new y value? 5. I mean, um, yeah. 5, right? Does so now my remember that my thing here says that if I took three of of the five thirds, I would get the same thing that I put in originally. I should get five thirds, right? That is essentially what my function, what this answer is telling me. It says, hey, if you do a one third horizontal dilation, if you plug that value back in to your x you'll get the same answer. Do I get the same answer? Do I get 5 thirds? No. No. No, right? I get 5. <laughs> 5 is not 5 thirds. B is not the answer. Now I can move on. C, the minimum value of f of of uh, three fourths x is less than the minimum value of f of x. Now, what did I say in B about horizontal uh, dilations and what they affect? They affect the x. They affect my x values. A minimum value is is uh, dependent on what your x or your y. X. Why? Your Y, right? Your Y is your minimum and maximum. So if a horizontal dilation doesn't affect the Y, why would it affect your minimum value? Would it affect your minimum value? I mean, if it doesn't affect it in any way, you know? Yeah, if it doesn't affect the, the Y values, it's not affecting the minimum. My minimum will stay the same, right? Think of the horizontal. I, I like the way the book, the, the book puts it. Imagine putting a hand on either side of the graph of F of X and then moving your right hand towards your left hand, right? So you have one hand next to the one and one hand next to the five, and slowly you move the five closer to the one. Right, that is a, a horizontal dilation. You are squishing it horizontally, right? Mm. So it doesn't affect your Y values. Now, D says there exists a value of X at which the graph of three fourths of four thirds X is tangent to the line Y equals three. So that is kind of fun, right? So, what do I want to do here? So first of all, it has a what transformation? Has a both a vertical and a horizontal translation. It has both Dilation. a horizontal and vertical. Mm -hmm. What is the scale factor of the vertical? Three fourths. Three fourths, as is. What about the horizontal? Three fourths too. Oh, it's also three fourths, right? Mm -hmm. Now, next thing. Now, what does it mean when a line is tangent? I think we went over that. I think I remember saying that. When a line is tangent to a graph, what does that mean? It runs along the same plane. What? Yeah. Does it run along the same plane? I mean, it's in the same plane, but it, it, it. It does intersect? something special. not intersect very close like intersect but I like it doesn't cross but like it touches exactly it touches the graph at exactly one point 
right? And I think we mentioned a secant line, which a secant line touches the graph twice. So a tangent only touches it once, meaning that if I were to draw it, let's see if I can get this to look nice. If I were to draw a tangent line, okay, uh, can I move it? Oh, no. Okay, that's more of a secant. Bear with me, bear with me. All right, oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe I can move it. Maybe it'll let me move it. Okay, imagine that, oh, you know what? I, I Wait, I can't fix this, I can't fix this. You zoom in info. There we go. I zoomed it in. Okay, so notice it'll just touch the graph once, right? That is a tangent line. Secant, like I, I mean, I drew like five secants in the attempt to get that one tangent. It cuts through two parts. So there exists a value of x at which the graph of all of that is tangent to the line at y equals three. So y equals three occurs where? Where y equals three, I don't even know how to draw that part. I like one and a half. Well, it would be, I don't know how to, how to draw it, but, <sighs> It would basically mean all the um, y values are three, mm -hmm. which doesn't make much sense because that kind of messes it up, but you know, you know, whatever. So if the y values are three, I'm gonna actually have to kind of erase some of this stuff because I don't have the space. So what I want to do, right, is I want to figure out which values I can get that will be at three. So if I do this, all of my, all right, this transformation means what? That what is being multiplied? The... The y? The y values, right? Yeah. So in this example, I kind of want to look over here. My graph has a maximum where? As a max, uh, x equals 5? At a, not at x equals 5, because that's like the end. Yeah. Remember, the maximum needs to be like the, it has a turning point. Mm-hmm. It needs to go from increasing or decreasing. So where on that graph has that maximum? Oh, uh, x equals 2. At x equals 2, 2 comma 4, right? Yeah, 2 4. So what I want to do now is I want to say, OK, let me go ahead and apply this transformation, that 3 fourths, to the maximum's y value, right? So. This equals what? Three. Oh, three. So three. What is my tangent line equal to? One third. What? No. Wait, that was the other question. Uh, three. The tangent line is three. Oh, okay. yeah. So now my my y. So typically a tangent line will hit a maximum point because if it hits anything lower, it is uh, going to intersect the graph, right? If mm -hmm. like, for example, in this function here, again, oh my gosh, again, remembering that five is not considered a maximum point because it's like a, an end kind of deal. So if I were to have drawn that, oh my gosh, <laughs> at y equals three, You know I, mean. I have a question. Yes. 
So when it comes to the test, when we get a question like this, I notice that you like there's you have to like do work for every single option. Was there like could there be a way where you don't have to do this amount of work? Because I know the multiple choice like you don't have like we don't have as much time. So right. I'm just so so I kind of do a bit extra. Um, but like for example, in this one, I would have already eliminated A mm -hmm. and C right off the bat because right. A has the shift to the left three don't mm -hmm. doesn't even matter i'm going to cross over the y-intercept that one's out uh c i know that a horizontal dilation affects the x's only so it won't affect the minimum value which would have left me with uh 3x which b and d right mm -hmm. now the key to me would have been that d has two uh dilations mm -hmm. and they are, when I'm looking at them, they are reciprocals. So in my head, that would have been like, okay, that's going to be something. And then also in B, for a value to undergo a dilation and end up with the same original X value is very mm -hmm. unlikely. So okay. I would have eliminated B and gone with D. Okay. So it's, it's a lot of like... Um, like for example, six right here, we, we're gonna do six super fast, okay? Horizontal asymptotes at y equals negative seven. What are my rules for horizontal asymptotes? I have to look at my what? Degrees. My, my leading degrees. If the degrees are the same, what is my asymptote? Zero. That's zero. Oh. It's going to be like the first term of like, you have to divide like the first term of each equation. Yes. So it is the ratio of the leading coefficients. So it would be like, if I had 2x squared and 3x squared, my asymptote would be at two thirds. Now, they are specifically telling me that my horizontal asymptote equals seven. So, or negative seven. This can only happen when I have the same leading degree right because if i had to have one degree that is higher than the other then what is it? if my numerator is higher then my i have a slant is that what it is yeah my numerator has a higher degree has exactly one degree higher than my denominator i have a slant asymptote if it is lower than the degree in the denominator i don't have any asymptote so the only way I can have negative seven as a possibility is if they are the same. Because if I have the whole situation of doing a slant asymptote, I'm going to have an equation, not an actual value. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So we see, Emmy, how, how I can get that really quick. Like I can say, okay, now I'm automatically eliminating all options yeah, where I my see. leading coefficients are not the same. Yes. Or my, like my leading degree. Now yes. it's just a matter of what equals negative seven. So negative 77 divided by 11 is? Negative seven. Negative seven. Yes. Right? One divided by one is just one. Yes. So we see how I was able to get that one quick. So a lot of it is also um, just more practicing. And, you know, we are going to do more reviewing. And I know that especially with unit one, we've kind of forgotten stuff. Which is normal because, you know, it's yeah. been uh, quite a while since we've done unit one. Um, but Thank hopefully you. these reviews start helping. I hope today was helpful. Um, we're already at 2.30, so I will let you guys go. Yes. Uh, oh, I have just another question. Would you recommend doing, like, the those quick and easy questions first and then going back and doing the long ones or just going in numerical order? And yes. Just so luckily, luckily for you guys, your test is still paper-based. It is non-adaptive. So my advice to you is read through all the questions quickly, get the ones that you can do right out of the way, and then go back and check the ones that you are a little bit unsure of. So when you are doing that, obviously you should also look through the, the easy ones you answered first, but you should try to get those done quickly. That way you get as many points possible already and then you can take your time and kind of go through the ones that are giving you problems right 
you should also note that when it comes down to the last five minutes or so, like if I'm doing the test and I am on question, I think 30 and there's 36 in part A or something like that. And I'm on question 30 and they call 10 minutes left. What I want to do is my advice to you is pick one option, like B. Pick B and put B for every single one of the last ones you have not answered yet, right? There's no penalty for guessing an answer. So you put B for all of them. So at least all of your questions are done. Then with those 10 minutes, you can go ahead and take your time trying to get the questions right. Right. But at least you have an answer for everything. And that applies to like SAT, although now SAT is on the computers. So I don't think that's as good an idea. But that is my my best advice for that. Movie. Do you know when we're going to receive the copies of this, like the book? Yeah. So I'm going to have I have to do them sometime this week. I'll try tomorrow to do them. Uh my, my hesitation has been because this book does not have like a three hole punch in it. So if I rip the pages out, which I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to have a bunch of loose papers, but I'm just going to hole punch them myself and put them in a binder. And um, what I might do is I might answer all of them myself, have an extra copy that I work through with you guys, but have a the binder filled with all the answers and the worked out solutions so that if you are doing this at home on your own pace, you can, you know, randomly at some point, oh, Ms. Perumo, can I check my answers? And then, boom, you have the book right in front of you. You can flip through it. You can see the answers. You can see the work and so on and so forth. So I think that that's what I'll do. Um, I will try to make those copies tomorrow, like I said. So that way, and that means that tomorrow or Tuesday, let me, let me clarify that. If I make the, the copies tomorrow, it will most likely be after fifth period. Um, so I will have them for you for Tuesday. Are there any other questions for me? No, that's it. No, ma'am. All, right. all right. So I'm glad you all uh, were able to make it today. I hoped it was helpful. Um, it was I, using like, like what's it called? Like refresh the mind a little bit. Like this is really ancient. Yeah, that's why I chose to do the unit one instead of going over stuff that um, we're doing now. Because I figure, you know, I, I want to do the review and it's better to do the review now while doing these double up review sessions while we have to still cover unit three and, and a little bit of unit two. So that way we're not so far behind. We're already getting the refresher. So. Yeah. So as long as it's good, um, I will upload this to the YouTube channel as well so that you can watch it again later. Um, as well as for all the people who were not able to attend today, uh, remember that Thursday's session will be at 7.45 p.m. I will send out the reminder for that. Um, and I will. it'll be a continuation. So in this one, we stopped on question six. So I will start Thursdays with question seven. So... If you guys can't attend it, that one will also be up on YouTube, so you don't miss out on the work. So, and Thursday, you know, what time? Huh? Thursday, what time? Seven forty-five. Okay. PM, not AM, because that's yeah, your time. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't no, know. Really... First period in a Zoom meeting. <laughs> so yeah. All right. So with that, you guys can enjoy the rest of your Sunday, and I will see you tomorrow. Wait, think about it all. See you tomorrow. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.